Uh, so what I want to present is essentially my experience and some thoughts uh, from teaching into uh, what I want to call voluntarily online courses. They were, they were online before we had to be online. Um, both of them are multi-section courses from first and second year in linguistics. Uh, and because they're multi-section, meaning you know, we'll have an online section and, and maybe several in-person sections, we want consistency in evaluative structure, some consistency uh, between the in-person and the online delivery. In addition to all the, you know, we always want the academic integrity uh, piece to be in place, right? Um, and uh, one thing I want to mention is, you know, there are good pedagogical reasons sometimes for prefer preferring alternative forms of evaluation. And I really liked that uh, we just heard about the idea of open book exams versus closed book exams. Uh, and, and other things like, like uh, take home exam slash assignment situations. But I'm talking about, you know, a, a, the kind of proctored exam or invigilated exam that we're used to uh, in a lot of these introductory courses. Uh, and I'm going to discuss some of the differences between in person and online exams and, and talk about some of the strategies I've used. And I also the, the requests part of my title is there's some things that would be really nice to have at an institutional level that individual instructors can't really do or can't do uh, as efficiently. So when I give a, a final exam on campus as instructor, I'm creating the exam. I'm sharing some details about that with my department for, for scheduling. I'm printing it off. I share it with the accessibility office for the students who have say time accommodations. Uh, and I'm there to supervise the exam in person. What I'm not doing, I'm not scheduling the exam. If it's a, if it's a registrar scheduled final exam, the registrar takes care of that. Um, someone else books the room that's large enough to hold my students. Uh, and um, someone else assesses the needs for accommodations, right? That's um, the, the accessibility office that we just uh, heard from. In an online course, uh, in a course that's scheduled as an online course, there is no central scheduling of the exam. I know in COVID, a lot of our remote instruction courses have those regular scheduled times. And even if you're not meeting with the students or, or doing stuff in those times, uh, that helps the registrar schedule the final exam. But a, a fully online sort of planned online course, the ones that I've done, don't have scheduled weekly meetings. And so they don't get fitted, fitted into that um, that final exam schedule, uh, there's no central booking of rooms because I think the assumption is you can do it all remotely. Even though with, with my online classes in, in previous years, at least half of my students in every section that I teach were in or near Edmonton, they were taking degree courses here. Um, and I ended up you know, booking a computer lab for them on campus, but I had to do that, that wasn't central. Um, with students writing remotely, uh, there's, they're not, leaning entirely on the institutional infrastructure, right? If you're writing in on campus, the room is on campus, that's taken care of someone else. But, but if you're writing remotely as a student, you have to make sure your computer's good to go, that your uh, internet connection is, is uh, up to the task. It also affects timing, right? I've had students from around the world. And if I have a student in China or in uh, the uh, United Arab Emirates, to take two examples that I've had, um, you know, a time that works really well in Edmonton may not work really well for people around the globe. So that's an, an issue that uh, a new issue you have to deal with. And, and uh, something that came up uh, on the chat actually during the previous talk is what if a student has a question? It can be a technical question. It can be a content question. Uh, that has to be dealt with differently in an online uh, environment. The fact that the exam is online, we've already learned, I'm not going to spend too much time on this, but it works differently, right? An e-class quiz doesn't have the same sort of open flexibility of question types that, you know, you writing out uh, in a word, word processor, you know, this is the exam that you're going to get on paper. All right. So, um, so no central scheduling of exams, no central booking of exam rooms. And with students writing remotely, there's less institutional support for what the student needs, time zone issues, and communication is a little bit more indirect. So what have I done to deal with this? Um, uh, so my experience comes before this uh, SEM stuff, which I really look forward to trying out next time I teach. Um, but 
the options that were mainly available to me were remote proctor, which costs money and I don't get funding for just teaching a course uh, or the exam lock. Uh, so exam lock has some features, but it's not a human being watching the students. So what I've done is have students arrange a local invigilator. So that there's a human being there, a third party that can report to me that the, the rules were followed. Um, and that's obviously a difficult process logistically um, in terms of uh, the student identifying someone, you know, if they're in a remote community, it may be difficult for them to find a person that, that meets my criteria. Uh, it's an extra burden for students who are honest because a dishonest student will just grab their friend and persuade their friend to, you know, I, I say will, uh, could, I guess. Um, and I can't pay the invigilators. So that's, that's an issue where I'm sort of relying on the kindness of strangers. Right. Uh, but local invigilators is one of the strategies that I've tried. Um, I, I use a, a registration form with the students. I set it up early in the term. Are you going to be writing on campus? Okay, that's, that's fine. You know, I can supervise you in a computer room, essentially like a regular uh, exam, except they're typing on computers instead of on paper. Uh, or are you going to be remote and then I have to in, invoke all of this other uh, paperwork? Um, and that's a way of getting the students invested because the way that I said it, if I try to have it equivalent, this invigilated exam, there's more work that the students have to do uh, than it for an on-campus class. Uh, scheduling is a real difficulty because during term time, students, like I say, more than half of my students have regular classes. So scheduling during term time isn't a great option because I, I might be conflicting, my exam might conflict with a class uh, that's scheduled. If I schedule it during the finals period, schedule my online final exam during the finals period, it might conflict with another final exam. And because my online classes aren't part of the uh, registrar scheduled exam system, you know, I, I don't have that institutional security of here's a block of time that's dedicated to my exam. Um, and during fall and winter, there's often a day or two between the end of classes and the start of the exam period. So I'll schedule the exam then. If I'm teaching in spring or summer, there isn't. Like there's, you know, one day classes end, the next day finals begin. Um, so scheduling is difficult. And of course, if I have people internationally, some places, you know, Friday is a, is a part of the weekend. Uh, and other places, you know, like you might have a, a stat holiday uh, that I can't anticipate because my my knowledge is is very localized so scheduling the exam is very uh can be very, very problematic um let's see uh one thing that i i have discovered is very important is decoupling the timing i'll have two separate times one for the people on campus so i'm just there invigilating that exam another time for the remote people uh, initially i thought i'd give them the same time because that's fair but then I'm answering questions in the computer room and taking phone calls for people from people remotely for technical issues and other uh, issues. And that was a disaster. So uh, a disaster. It, it was suboptimal, let's say. Um, but when you have two separate times, systematically two separate times for the people who are here and people aren't, that introduces the possibility of inequity. So it's not ideal, but it, it is a solution that, that I have used. Um, Right. And there are other things to do with the setup of questions like we heard about, you know, randomizing and whatnot. I'm not going to get into those uh, because I see that I'm running lower on time. Uh, so the solutions that I've, I've outlined here, local invigilators, which is a deeply frustrating uh, solution for me. But like I say, I, I want an invigilated exam and I don't really feel comfortable with the other alternatives. Uh, or I haven't, like I say, there are new alternatives that have sort of sprouted up in, in COVID times that are kind of intriguing. I look forward to trying them out. Uh, using a, a very early in the term, a, an exam registration process that's almost like an assignment. Students have a date by which they have to submit this form to get them involved in the process because when I don't do that, they uh, there are students who will leave it till the last minute. And uh, yeah, that's not a good uh, turnout. Um, scheduling, you know, there are some creative solutions for scheduling uh, between term time and the exam period. There are problems with that, but uh, it's something that you can consider if you have these, this situation. 
uh, and decoupling the timing. So have, have separate times for the online and the not online versions. Obviously that's a solution that nobody's gonna have to worry about again until we're done with the, the COVID stuff, but uh, right. Um, so the main uh, takeaways uh, here, uh, one of the lessons that I've learned doing this for several years now, uh, it's four or five years, I think, uh, is that trying to make an online exam work exactly the same as an in-person exam, it tends to uh, exaggerate accessibility problems for people who are already disadvantaged. Like I said, the people with in, in remote uh, rural communities, you know, they'll have poor internet connections, which is a problem for a, a timed exam that requires an internet connection and uh, less access to resources like local invigilators and, and whatnot. Um, it increases the stress for everyone involved. For me, because I have all these extra tasks that are normally handled centrally, now I have to take care of as the instructor. Uh, and it increases the stress for the students because it's an unfamiliar kind of thing, uh, often carrying a large weight of a part, portion of their course weight. Uh, and yes, it increases the administrative workload for the instructor. Um, and I found that some of these difficulties can be alleviated. Um, I think they could be alleviated even more if we had uh, online exams incorporated into the, the centrally scheduled final exam system. I don't know how that would work. It's not my expertise. There are people who do the scheduling who are experts and I would love to talk with them and see what sort of solutions we could come up with. Um, our exam policies at the university don't generally anticipate the issues around remote exams. And I think we're in a great position now where almost everyone has experience with it. And, and maybe we could, uh, could adapt our policies a little bit to, uh, to capture that. Um, in terms of invigilators, it would be great, although probably unrealistic to expect uh, some kind of uh, invigilation uh, what, what do you want to call it? reciprocity with other institutions so that when I have a student in Toronto, I can look to U of T or some other university there to say, hey, uh, I need an invigilator for this exam and maybe vice versa. Um, that would be, that would alleviate some of the invigilation issues for remote, uh, truly remote uh, online exams. Um, I really like the idea of academic integrity training. You know, a lot of what I've learned is either um, trial and error, and the errors feel really awful because, you know, an er error on my part is stress and difficulty on the student's part. Uh, and, you know, consulting, when I, when I realize there's a problem, consulting with CTL or someone, uh, but to have some integrated academic integrity training like Helen described would be really helpful uh, for those, that extra load that instructors take when they're teaching remotely or online. And Pedagogically, I think there, it is worth me as an instructor, all of us as instructors, thinking seriously about alternative forms of assessment, uh, not being locked into the, the, the sort of sit and write a multiple choice or a, 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 a in-person exam, but think of assignments, open book, book exams and other things like that. And I see that a lot of the advice we're getting uh, through you know, COVID support does suggest this, uh, but like I say, some of our exam policies aren't quite as compatible with, with the changes that might be helpful for, for us and for our students and for the academic uh, uh, goals that we're after. Uh, so, yeah, so that's essentially all I have to say, you know, sort of sharing some of my uh, experience, some of the things that I've tried. And like I say, some of them are more successful, some of them are, are less successful. And, and what I think we could really do as an institution to... Uh, to, to help everyone, lift everyone to a, a higher level of academic integrity and, and excellence in how we do these, you know, very common and, and substantial portions of the assessment for a lot of our courses.